try to keep uh, the time schedule. <laughs> and all right, let's uh, Sean. Great. Hey, everybody. Uh, my name is Sean. And I'm coming from Tokyo. And it's really um, been a really fantastic week for me to be here. I wasn't able to join the, the first um, uh, week, but I'm excited to watch the videos. And um, I'm primarily an experimentalist. And so I have, a, I have a few goals in mind for today's talk. And uh, one goal is to introduce an experimental technique that my group and other groups use called NanoSIMS, nano secondary ion mass spectrometry. Introduce that as a tool um, to probe um, a, a number of different questions. But in this talk, we're going to be probing uh, phenotypic heterogeneity within cultures. I want to introduce this as a tool, and I want, I want especially the introduction of the tool part um, uh, of my time today to be really discussion-based. Uh, because this is a tool, it's not necessarily that hard to use, but um, riding a bike is also not that hard to do once you know how to do it. And so if you don't know how to use the nanosims, it's kind of, at first I think it's kind of like, how, how do you do this? So, so I want to have lots of uh, questions uh, about that, especially if, if people want to use this tool um, and, and develop this as a kind of a community resource that we can apply. Then I want to introduce um, some data um, that we've acquired using this tool and, and, and show you what these spreads of data look like when we look at isotope incorporation. This is an anabolic activity of the cell. We're looking at the accumulation of material into cells, tracing that by using stable isotopes. What does that distribution look like? And how, what, what types of parameters change the shape of that distribution? And it's during this part of the talk where I want to start asking um, you questions. And part, so part of my goal to come to this meeting is to present some things that I don't know how to explain. And as an as a experimental scientist, this is the, when I, when I can obtain data that I don't know how to explain, this is a really fun time to interact with modelers and, and, and theoreticians. So that's part of my goal as well. Those are the main goals I have in, in, my, in mind. Um, Great. Um, oh, and I can also just briefly introduce my institute. I'm from the uh, Earth Life Science Institute at, at Tokyo Tech. We're an institute that has uh, planetary scientists and uh, geologists and a little bit of chemistry, also a little bit of uh, microbiology in there. So we're trying to find out how, how life started and how it might start on other planets and how we might find it um, if it started on other planets as well. OK, great. So this is a really, really basic introduction slide, and I basically I don't even actually I don't need it for this room. We we know that we if we have an isogenic culture, we know that the cells can behave very very differently within this that um, flask or whatever medium that is. And so how can we study study this variability? And there's been a few different talks um, this week where people have looked at this var variability, and. Uh, I'm going to introduce and focus on this nanosims technique, but I think one of the fun things for us to think about doing and to learn how to do is to, to work across our kind of instrumental toolboxes. So uh, you know, I don't know how to run a mother machine, uh, but I know how to run the nanosims. And so, uh, part, so this is maybe another goal that I have in mind to, uh, about being here, is to try to uh, teach each other different tools so that we can really acquire uh, multidimensional data sets that can allow us to understand um, cells and, and, and cultures in higher levels of detail. So NanoSIM's uh, experiment looks something like this. We uh, take some stable isotopes. So, so, for, so first of all, let's take a really big step back. So take, take uh, carbon. 99% of the carbon on planet Earth about is has an atomic mass of 12. There's 1% of the carbon that has an atomic mass of 13. It's stable, never changes. Um, there's a little tiny, tiny bit of deuterium in, in, in the water that, that I have waiting for me on my desk chair over there. Little tiny bit of deuterium, much less natural abundance than 1%. Look at nitrogen, natural abundance of nitrogen on planet Earth, take 15 over 14, you get a ratio of 0 0.0036 about. So this, is, this has to do with um, how the planet has formed um, it's different if you go to Mars, different if you go to Venus. Um, but, on, but on Earth, we have these stable isotope values. And through the tools of chemistry, we can purify isotopes. And so we can, 
we can now go on Sigma and buy 100% labeled 13C glucose or 100% labeled 13C acetate. Or, um, you can't get it for everything, but you can get it for a lot of um, compounds that you might be interested in, like N2 or ammonium. So an Anasim's experiment is the type of experiment where you take cells that are natural abundance, and there are going to be small variations in the cells and between cells that are occurring in this kind of natural abundance range. This is going to be due to kinetic isotope fractionation that happens in metabolism. And also, it's going to be due to equilibrium isotope effects. But for a nanosims experiment, we're just going to ignore these really small variations. And we're going to focus on really large variations. The precision of the nanosims instrument, it's about uh, 10 parts per thousand. It's not, we can't see the kinetic isotope effects with the nanosims. And we can't really see equilibrium isotope effects. But if I take a 10% uh, label strength of ammonium, and I put that into a culture of cells where the, nat where the natural abundance, 15 over 14, is around 0 0.0036. We can certainly see that with the nanosims. So we can see like atom percent enrichments with the nanosims. We can't see these really subtle variations that geochemists study. It would be great to do that with the nanosims, but we just don't get the secondary ion counts that would be sufficient. We don't have the counting statistics to have a really, really high level of precision. It's a bit of an aside. Type of experiment we do, we, we, we dump in a lot of stable isotope. This is the type of um, amount of isotope that for us as, uh, as bio, biologists, we're fine. You know, I've, I've talked to people who have told me they would, they would feel comfortable eating a 13C sandwich. You know, it's not, the kinetic isotope effect for 13C is not so big. Deuterium is, right? We saw this um, interesting uh, paper that Eric showed yesterday. Deuterium will, will change you. 13C, uh, we, you know, I, I don't know anybody who has actually ate, eaten that sandwich, but it's, but it's a lot um, <laughs> more modest of an effect. If you walk down the hall in my institute, there's a stable isotope geochemistry lab, and if I tell them I'm going to do a, use a 1% label, they, they tell me don't come into my laboratory for a week because we're worried that it's like it's the winter time. I'm starting to grow out a beard. And they're worried that a little bit of acetate is stuck on me. And it's going to get into their lab, and it's going to get into the instrument, and, it's gonna, and their instrument is going to record enriched levels of 13C for, like, for history. <laughs> so that's the level that they operate. And then, and then Anasims were really operating at this really, really wild enriched um, uh, kind of area of, of isotopes. Dump in a lot of isotopes. It's typical for us to use 10% label strength, 20% label strength. And then the other thing we have to think about is how long we're going to incubate to be able to see a signal. Typically, when we design experiments, we incubate for a third or a half of a doubling time. So we want to try to get a picture, you know, kind of an instantaneous picture, if you will, about how fast cells are eating and accumulating these isotopes. And so depending on the questions that you have, you might um, incubate some deuterium and some ammonium and CO2 if it's an autotroph, et cetera. And then um, the nanosims, we'll have, I'll show a series of pictures to try to help us understand how the instrument actually works physically. But let's see, this works. I heard it had a leg. It does. <laughs> so the, the way that the instrument works is there's a, there's a small cylinder, and it's filled with cesium carbonate. And around the cylinder of cesium carbonate is a tungsten filament, and that tungsten filament heats up puts a lot of energy into this little cylinder of cesium carbonate. And the cesium carbonate cylinder has a little pinhole on it. And so cesium ions just kind of come spewing out of this little tiny cylinder. Those are positively charged. You've got a cesium carbonate salt. You're heating it up. You're supplying all this kinetic energy. And the ions are just starting to spew out of it. You just do that by heat. And as these ions are spewing out, um, you, have, uh, you put a voltage right near the source. So you've got positive ions coming out, you put, a, you put positive potential there, and you shoot these cesium ions away from the ion source. And then the nanosims has a whole bunch of ion optics, all of these um, plates and uh, little tiny quadrupoles that are focusing these cesium ions to smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller beam size, up until the point where you get a beam size of about 70 to 80 nanometers. 50 nanometers is 
is pretty achievable. You can go smaller, you can go to 10 nanometers, but, the, but you pay a price for that, and the price that you pay is the amount of secondary ion that you get out. So you can, you can see more, you can see at higher resolution laterally, but the higher and higher you see in, in your lateral um, resolution, the less and less secondary ion signal you get out. So there's a little, bit, there's a trade-off here. In practice, yeah, 80, 70 nanometers spatial resolution, you get good secondary ion counts out. What do I mean by good? I mean at the label strengths that we're operating with, the um, preci precision of the instrument, um, it, it amply covers um, the, the ion count. So we don't have to, to, to worry so much about the amount of error the amount of signal that we can add with a stable isotope is so big, um, it's not like we're measuring noise, basically. Yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. So then, so you, you take this yellow, this orange arrow, and you raster that over your sample. Um, and um, you dwell um, for a period of time at every point, and you count ions. And you can count, it depends on the SIMS instrument, but on the newer ones, you can count seven different ions at a time. Um, it's a, um, uh, what's it called? There's a little cup. Uh, it's a, got it in a slide over here. What kind of detectors are these? They're Faraday cups, if I remember right. Um, this is this is blurry, but if we go, so yeah, this is blur. <laughs> What's going on here? We've got a. Here's where our little uh, come here arrow. Up on the top, there's a primary ion beam source. That's this cesium carbonate. It comes shooting out. It takes the corner to the left, and you've got a sample. Here's this little orange noodle on the left, which is the cell, and then this. That starts fragmenting the cell and, or anything that's down, down there. Yeah, yeah. Secondary ions come out. And then um, in the bottom right-hand corner of this uh, picture, this kind of blue zone where there's these, air, these, 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 um, these lines taking a corner, there's a big magnet. And it, it's like a meter long. Um, and so remember your Lorentz force, you've got ions. You're passing ions across a magnet, and they take a radius. They take a corner. And because the ions are different masses, they take a uh, different radius. And so the small, small ions take the corner tight, and the heavy ions take it wide. And, and then you have these little Faraday cups, and you're, you're counting current. So we, yeah, you measure current, current. It's a mass spec. Yeah. So you're, you go, you've got this primary ion beam, and it's just rastering over the sample. And then you're recording seven different uh, masses as you as you raster around, and that allows you to generate a picture, and it's a and it's a picture made out of out of ions. Yeah. Thanks for asking that. It's it's. Let me go. So I'm going to show this picture in a few different ways to try to help us. You know, build, everybody build build a picture in their mind. Primary ions come come in. The the place that the primary ions come from, it's got positive charge, and it's forcing these positive ions away. And the sample itself, here's a little patch of cells um, that might be a, a sample, that's negatively charged. And so the, the sample itself is sucking in these negative ions. And, uh, sorry, it's sucking in the positive ions, and they're stuck there. And they're stuck there up until the point that you put so much positive charge in there that it can't take it anymore. And then the positive charge will start to, start, start to leave. But um, since the sample is negatively charged, anything that's negatively charged wants to leave. So it's, it's, it's um, rejected and, and pushed away from the sample. And so you, you can actually run the instrument in different um, polarities. You can shoot negative ions at the sample and then collect positive ions that are forced away from the sample. But usually, for ions like uh, carbon and what we collect for nitrogen, we collect the cyanide ion, which happens to be a, a really uh, stable molecular fragment. Those are negative ions. And so those, those are um, ejected from the sample. And they, those go through a whole bunch of ion optics. And yeah, into this 
thing that's called a mass spec, which is, which is really just a giant magnet and then has these Faraday cups positioned at really, really um, specific locations to catch these ions at different radii. Yeah. Any other question about the instrument? Yeah. Uh, at the end of the day, do you get the concentration of those negative ions in the region where uh, the ray, the the uh, 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 the region that was bombarded? Sorry, I just I just realized I left a pitcher of water over here. That's, this is like my uh, you know my PhD advisor. I, he would come into the lab. I'll, I'll get to your questions in a second. He'd come into the lab, and I would have all these flasks, you know, on my bench, like. <laughs> <laughs> like this, and you know, I, I just, I just never change. So he'd come in and be like, "You're going to pay for that." <laughs> you know, so can you say your question one more time? <laughs> yeah. So um, when you have finally uh, all those ions which are uh, coming out at different locations, uh, what are you probing about the cell there? The concentration of those ions in the cell where this bombardment took place is that what? Yeah. Yeah, so you, you raster around, and, and I just said you, you raster around and you stay in one place for some amount of time. So you can raster really quick or you can raster really slow, and you can raster again and again and again. And so either way you do it, you, you end up, you can burn through, you can collect all of the material that a cell is made out of. You can collect all of it and you can count all of it. Turning that into a concentration is, is dubious, just like it, it is, like, like doing quantitative mass spec is hard, right? I want, to, I want to take ion counts and convert it into femtomoles of, of carbon. Maybe possible, but I'm, it's going to take, take some dedication to do that. But, es but essentially, what we do is exactly what you said. We don't know for sure about the ionization response rate of every different cell. So if you do this with a cell of one biomass and a cell of a different biomass, or the same types of cells on different types of substrates, you might get a different secondary ion response, you get a different current, and you might be misled about how much material you've actually um, scooped up by, by shooting this primary ion beam down. But we do exactly what you say, it's just hard to quantify that. So what we do, instead of saying, I've measured this much carbon, is we say, I've got an amount of carbon-12, an amount of carbon-13, now I can take the ratio of those, and if I've done this t type of stable isotope probing experiment, I can, I can monitor the ratio of change going from natural abundance to en enrichment. And that tells me something about how much the cell has been eating. Yeah, thanks for the question. Yeah, okay. go ahead. Um, so the samples have to be fixed, right? That's right. So the cells are all dead, um, which is yeah, maybe the biggest drawback of this technique. Cells are dead. Do you have to fix them? No. Um, if you fix them, it's been shown, and it's really, really important what's been shown. You, you fix them with aldehydes. So your aldehydes are they're, they're natural abundance. And so you've done the stable isotope experiment, and if you fix with aldehydes, you introduce, you dilute the carbon. You add some non-labeled carbon, and so that gives you an offset. So you can look at kind of raw cells, but they're dead. They're dry. We're at minus 10 to the minus 15th pore. Okay. Really dry. Right. So when you rasterize several times at the same spot, you don't expect stuff to have gone away in the meantime. Because, I mean, like, uh, if they aren't fixed, but, like, I guess if they are dry, then, yeah. like, there is no yep. solution. And yep. the second question is, like, what limits the number of secondary ions you get? Because you said you have seven, like, you can detect up to seven, but, like... Ah, great. Um, yeah. That's purely logistical. And I'm, I'm sorry, this, this diagram is really kind of junky, but it's the one that Kamika makes, and, but it's actually, it's actually good because it's got all of the details in it. So you've got your secondary ion beam coming out here on the bottom, going to the right, and that's getting focused. Um, and here's your big magnet down here, it's a big black magnet. And the only thing that limits you is, well, so you've, how many trolleys, how many Faraday cups can you put in there? How and how much, how much of an arc can, is available to you. So you could imagine, so it's actually just, it's completely instrumental de design. So um, they, they, they started out making these with five, now they make them with seven, that you could go to 10 or 15. 
you do run into problems with like with yeah, what's going on with the current and, and how, how much space you have available here. But for example, the instrument at Caltech, the data that I'm gonna show in a slide or two, the instrument at Caltech, the operator of the sims, he's, he's wonderful and he's the type of person that we could say, we wanna measure deuterium and protons and 13C at the same time. You can't do that with the commercially purchased instrument. It doesn't. You, you can't position, you don't have a, a big enough radius, you don't have a big enough width to catch the HD and way over here, um, 12, 13, and then the 15N species, and 14N species. So Yunbin, he's awesome, he said, oh, okay, um, well next time I'm doing maintenance on the instrument, I'll, um, there's this little metal piece and I'm gonna file it down. And uh, we'll be able to push that over just a little bit and it'll be enough to capture the whole width. And uh, so that's the only instrument in the world that I know that can go, that can capture this really big range. So I'm, I'm, I'm still using that instrument because of that nice end sample from Tokyo. And, yeah. Any other, yeah, go. Um, so can you remind me what the resolution is that you can probe the cells? Is it like, can you distinguish what goes into the membrane from the cytosol or is it the comparison between cells? Let me show a picture. So it's something like, uh, yeah, 70, 80 nanometers or so. So this, I don't know from where you're sitting, how much you can see or how good your eyes are. Um, so this is a pseudomonas here. And I don't know, if you, if you look really closely, you can see this is, a, this is a 14N carbon map. We catch the cyanide ion. That's, that's, that has to do with like molecular orbital theory and one ion being more stable than another. But this, you could count, treat this as a nitrogen ion image. And you can see it's brighter here and a little bit dimmer there. Here, here's some, maybe a couple cells that are clumped up. And you can see it's a little bit less um, bright in the, in the center. I don't know if you can see that from where you are. So you, you, you can see a little bit of internal structure in, inside of the cell. And it's definitely good enough to see between cells. Yeah, so um, if I have time, I'll go into a little bit of um, looking at cellular aggregates that are multi-species and, and, and using this technique as a way to, to try to understand um, what, at what cells might be sharing with one another when they grow in consortium. So you can see the cell boundary really clearly when they're growing in consortia. That's exactly what they are. Yep. Yep, exactly. Exactly. Yeah, just like you were talking about yesterday. Yeah, about Poisson. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Okay. This is great. Thanks for asking questions. Yeah. This is this is good. So I have a technical question because I don't really know this form of ionization. Do you see any effects of uh, which species ionize first and which like for which ones you kind of need to uh, kind of bombard? Uh, for a longer time with CS plus? Yeah, that's a really, really fun question and it's something I'd like to know more about. And um, we have done a little bit of work, but I don't know systematically about that. Um, I said on this image, the positive ions, they're kind of getting sucked into this negative plate and then these negative ions are getting rejected. But the kind of ion extraction efficiency of those negative not equal for different species. And so we, we did a test, and I don't, I don't have the data in these slides, but um, yeah, it looks like, for example, the, the 13 ions, the 13 C ions start to get rejected a little bit sooner than the, than the 14 in carbon, the cyanide ion. I don't, I don't know why that is, but it's really, really interesting, and it's super important for these types of studies. And I will be the person to admit, I think this is being even filmed, but um, I, I will admit that most microbiologists, you know, we, we, we shoot primary ions into the sample until we get what we think is an acceptable secondary ion count rate, and then we capture that, and we, and we use those data. But um, there is something um, underlying that, and it's, it, it's exactly your question, and I don't think it's systematically understood. It could even be that, you know, in the first, um, the first, you know, re rejected ions are from different types of biomolecules. And, and 
we don't, I don't have any information about that. It's really interesting to think about, and I think it's a really important question. So as a follow-up, this would also mean that maybe you could um, kind of suppress the signal of certain ions depending on the presence of other ions. Yeah, yeah, and, and vice versa. Yeah, so I've thought about you know, like what, what types of compounds could we add to get greater ionization out? Mm. Because the cyanide ion, for example, it's great. You get these really high intensities out. Your counting statistics are good. Everything's fine. Deuterium's kind of like your own, you're scraping by. Carbon's OK. But it'd be, it'd be really fun to think about adding, add, adding molecules to that, that will increase the secondary ion efficiency. Yeah, great question. So uh, I, I'm not sure how dumb this question can be, but the, this thing is about mass spectroscopy always got, got my curiosity in the sense that you're always measuring the ratio, uh, mass to charge ratio. That's the thing that you're measuring. Yeah. And, but in this case that you have uh, isotopes and ions, so you're always changing mass, you're always changing, actually your things have different masses and different charges, can you get wrong reads just because of that? I mean, or is this thing always well defined? I have that mass and that charge and I exactly know what it is. Okay, so in this case, so we've got, we've got what we call a magnetic sector instrument. And so we've got this stream of ions, and it's got everything in there. And we take that stream of ions and accelerate them. We've got, so we've got voltage, we're accelerating ions, and we've got a magnet. And then the ions are taking the corner at a different radius according to their mass. And so what we do with this instrument is we position these little catcher's mitts, these Faraday cups, at what we think is the right radius. So you can, you can put it in the wrong place and catch some ion. So the question is, how do you know what we're seeing, right? So, what, so when we start off, what we do is we put in some standard things. That we, we know this material has tons of carbon and lots of nitrogen. And so basically, there has to be some, some initial kind of field studies where we're like, OK, this, this is really where protons are. So you first, what you do is you physically move that Faraday cup, and you get it close. But then after that, you can't move things mechanically um, good enough. And so then you start to tune the ion beam that's going in there to, to get rid of, to skim off the ions that might be really close in mass. And, and there are like contaminating ions that are really, really close. Like there's this boron species that always messes up our nitrogen a lot of boron and a lot of glass that we use. So we're now moving to stainless steel surfaces to get rid of that. Um, but you can see that you can't position in physically, you can't position that Faraday cup properly, but you can use the electronics of the instrument to skim off those ions that are just a little tiny bit heavier. Yeah. Um, it's a great question. And, and we, we've collected junk data sets yeah. <laughs> where it's like, this, it's impossible that there's this much 15N well, and then you look, and it's boron. <laughs> so we're, we're going to stainless steel. Yeah. yeah this, is, this is really great. Uh, maybe I should say, I think we're, we're all very eager to learn about how this machine is really working. So it's great to learn about that. But if we're taking away your ability to talk about what you actually wanted to talk about, you should feel free to completely I'm, ignore I'm, us and move on. So I, I, I see, but I see a balance continue, here. So. And I'm going <laughs> to ask you. So. Okay, so you're shooting these ions at the cells. I presume they just go through the membrane, maybe come out the other end even. Some of them get stuck inside. I'm just, you're saying, okay, so now the cells eject ions. So yeah. what is really happening? Are they opening pores and then these things are accelerated in the electric field? Are the cells already bothered by the electric field? You, you put them in, right? Because they also have this membrane potential that they're trying to. Yeah. I, I'm just trying to understand what's happening to these poor cells as you shooting the ion beam at them. Yeah. And why are they letting the ions out? Such a fun question. Um, nobody really knows, but I'll, I'll, I'll just talk about how I think about it for a moment. So, and I'll, and I'll talk a little bit about observations. So at first, when you start, you start putting these cesium ions, you're shooting cesium ions, 
in, in, onto the surface. And at first, you don't get any secondary ions out. Where are they? What's going on? At first, the positive ions just stick. So there's a, there's a kind of a reservoir capacity of, of the material to just take up cesium ions. And they're just sticking in there. You're not getting any secondary ions out. What's going on? Eventually, you put so many cesium ions in that it's like the way I think about it, and this is just speculation, there's just not room to have anything else in there. And something's got to leave. And, that, and then you start to get your secondary ions out. What do you get out first? As you raster and you count, if, so if you, it's possible that you just raster, you stay here until there's no more ions, and then you move along. And you stay here until there's no more ions, and then you move along, and you make your picture that way. But you can also raster for very, very, very quickly, and, and then take many, many frames of data. And when you do that, if you raster quickly and you take many, many frames of data, you can really see that you're burning through the cell. And so that tells me that it's really a surface analytical technique. So at first, and maybe this is going to this former question a little bit, um, at first you are seeing the, the, the outside of the cell, and then you're getting into the cell, and then finally you're back in the membrane. And so it is interesting to think about kind of doing a depth profile as you burn through uh, the cell and, and try to recover some of the three-dimensional information that way. Yeah. Okay, maybe one or two more questions and then I'll, I'll get some data. But this is, I, I one, one or two more, because this is part of why I'm here, is to, like, I, I want to learn about how, so what, what I, I'm going to kind of bl blow my cover here and say, I'll introduce some data, things that I'm confused about, and then I want to try to introduce a few ways that I think we can go, we can, how, how, we, how can we, for example, do lineage resolved um, isotope incorporation measurements? And, and to do that, I need, I need to learn how like mother machines work and, and things like that. So, so I'm really, ha and, and vice versa, you know, if we can share this stuff together. So is there one more question? <laughs> yeah. Um, I was just wondering, like, regarding this uh, profile and structures inside the cell and so on, I realized the, the treatment that you need to apply in the cells before you get them through the machine might completely affect, like by dry them, for example, you get rid of the cytoplasm, uh, how the things are then sort of going to be on the membrane or like on the site and so on. The inner structure, I'm not sure how meaningful it is then, yeah. uh, because you transform it a lot by sort of yeah. removing all the water in there, right? That's right. Yeah. So we're not looking at the metabolome. Yeah, we're really looking at the large biomolecule. Um, it, yeah, and you, and you can show that actually really nicely with, uh, if you do this deuterium label, you, you, you can show that you wash out all of the exchangeable protons. Yeah, so you get rid of the metabolome and all exchangeable protons. You, you, you do some water rinsing or something. Yeah. Good question. So what are you left with? You're, you're left with like, you know, the, the, the big molecules of biochemistry. Yeah. Okay, cool. So let's, um, Let's look a little bit at some data together. Uh, and then I'm going to, yeah, so I want to introduce the type of data that we can, we can observe with this instrument, what it looks like, introduce a few brief findings, and then um, get into some questions that I have and, and maybe have more of a discussion about how we could use these data together. And then if there is time, I'll, I'll go a little bit into space. But I think this first part might not actually be enough. Here's what it looks like. Um, this is for, uh, these are images of uh, staph. Here on the left is the 12C ion image. Middle is the cyanide image. And on the right is the proton image. And I put some little notes on the bottom of the slide. So if we add a 13C compound, we'll have a corresponding map of 13C. And we can put those images right on top of each other. And then now we've got, for every cell, we've got an isotope ratio of that cell. Do the same thing with 15N. And we can do the same thing with uh, deuterium. And conceptually, we might think about adding 13C and using that um, to estimate both the biosynthetic rate and perhaps uh, compound preference if we've got a complex media. If you've got a really defined media, it's, it's going to be tightly related to biosynthetic rate, but if you've got a complex media, you might be able to distinguish um, some nutrient preference. And the same is true um, 
with a 15N label that you might add. If it says complex media, you might see that sometimes the cells are eating, some of the cells are eating ammonium, and some of them are eating amino acids, and you can, and you can find that. Deuterium, um, especially from water, I think is, is rather interesting. When cells synthesize their fatty acids, for example, they require protons. And if you add protons in the form of deuterium, you can use this as a sort of a general tracer for, for biosynthetic rate. And that's how we've, we've used that in the past. And, and, I, and I like that because it seems like if you go out um, into the environment, you get some complex community, you don't know anything about nutrient preferences, you don't know much about the, even the media, or the, you know, if you're in ocean water or something. But if you add deuterium, you kind of have this general marker of biosynthetic activity. How much, how much material is being incorporated into this system that's, that's growing? Good question. Sorry, um, you, you were commenting on that, but I think I missed it. But you said that you need to use a lot of um, isotopes to start with, right? And you also, we, we've seen yesterday, and you were also mentioning that, that the deuterium is changing sort of yeah. all the rates in your cells. Yeah. So how is this sort of not affecting then, like how is this a good metric for like uh, growth rates and rates, or biosynthetic rates, when we know that it's changing the rates? Yeah, so with, um, with deuterium, the natural abundance of deuterium is it's really, really low. And so even if we use a one or 5% label strength of water, it's, it's like unbelievably huge compared to natural abundance. I forget, like 10,000 times higher or something. It's really, really high. Um, but, you know, there, is, there will be a phenotype with 1% D2O. Like it's, like it's, deuterium is really, <laughs> really different from proton, so. Um, Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's a good question. Yeah, it's a really great question with deuterium, and then yeah, with 13C, there are those who will say they'll have a 13C sandwich for lunch. So I, I don't know. Um, okay. So I said you can you can start to use these tracers for to estimate growth rates, and you can do that um, like this. You conceptually. The way I think about it is you start out with a cell, and it's, it's made of natural abundance material. And then the cell's growing, and it divides. And it's taking up, um, we, so we kind of never use 100% label strength, because we don't need to. So it's taking up natural abundance label, and it's also taking up um, the, the stable isotope that you've got in there. And so if the cell divides, if the mother and the daughter cell are equal, equal mass, you've doubled your mass, and you can think about the you can relate the accumulation of isotope to, to a doubling rate. And one of the questions that I have that, um, that I want to discuss with, with people in the room is whether or not the mass of mother and daughter cells is equivalent. And what is the asymmetry of material um, uh, uh, between mother and daughter cells when there is division? But if we just think about it from a really naive perspective that there is no asymmetry in division, and the mother cell is exactly the same mass as the, the, the two cells that are created after that, then we can use some really simple math to say there's been this much isotope incorporation, and that is going to um, re be related to this doubling time, just by, mo by knowing the time, the labeling strength, and the amount of um, label that was incorporated into the sample, the cell. Okay. Um, there's some questions about um, spatial resolution. How good is it? What is it? You know, we've got these planktonic cells on the left. We can see them. Here's a consortia on the right from a um, from a methane cold seep. So these this is a consortia made out of um, amine archaea and uh, sulfate reducing uh, uh, delta proteobacteria. Um, and in the right, we I'm I'm displaying. Uh, an isotope ratio image, and in, in this case, it's the it's showing the atom percent incorporation of 15N. And so we can see that some cells, in this case, the experiment was was using ammonium. We can see that some cells within this consortia are taking up a lot more ammonium than the other cells. So presumably, they're growing faster than the other ones. Okay, let's go back um, to planktonic cells and grow cells in a chemostat. And so here is a chemostat experiment, um, same 15N uh, image as, as before. But if we look at the if we look at the accumulation of 15N 
and 14N, or deuterium protons, we can, we can uh, make a histogram plot of what that accumulation is. And on the right, what is shown is a plot that we have used deuterium incorporation per cell to estimate the doubling time. And here in the middle is um, the average of, of the distribution. And the x-axis is a log transformed, um, is log transformed, here, if I can get this pointer out, maybe I can't. It's log, tra log transformed um, mu, specific growth rate. So it looks like for, for these cells, this is staph um, in chemostat in a complex media. Uh, the deuterium in incorporation and the estimated doubling time of these cells, every little um, kind of hatch mark here is one individual cell. This just, it looks like there's this log normal distribution of growth rates at the single cell level. Yeah. Yeah, great. Yeah, thanks. How's the experiment done? Yeah, we've got a chemostat. You've got a chemostat. They're growing in there, and they're eating non-isotope labeled yep. initially. Yep. Then you give some Pulse. media where now a certain percentage is isotope labeled, and you yeah. know this percentage. Yep. And then you just give a certain amount of stuff, or you give it for a certain amount of time, or it's the same thing maybe. Um, and then you wait some time, and then you take them out? Yeah. Chemostat, steady state, switch over to isotope, wait, in this case it was a half of a doubling time, and then take out a little bit, and then go to the And then these are the, this is the distribution of the estimate of growth rate, assuming everybody is taking up this rate at the same time, uh, at the same rate, and, and using this formula that you have. And, and so you look per cell and you estimate per cell what fraction have the isotope. Mm -hmm. And then you sort of log transform that and divide by mu, uh, by T get a mu. Yep. We but do you know what the error bar is on this number that you measure? On, I mean, how accurate can uh, you per say? Cell. Yeah. yeah, I don't, I'd have to go, oh, I, we do know. Um, it's much smaller than, than this. Um, uh, what is, yeah, I have to dig into the supplement. So, but are we really seeing like from one tail of the distribution to the other tail like eight times 32? Is it 256? Yeah. 256 fold yeah. rate a change yeah. in yeah. growth rate? Apparently. Yeah. Did so this, th this I think, is really different from what you see in a mother machine, isn't it? What is the, so I, I'm confused. 30%. This is, right. So this is, this is an area that I'm here to, <laughs> yeah. Many orders of magnitude mm -hmm. more. Yeah, so this seems weird. Yeah. So. It's good to, to talk about what this might mean, yeah. So, so I had another question, but now that I heard this description. Um, so you, uh, you change the feed, but then it will take some time before the medium in the chemostat is completely um, mm. replenished, right? So uh, at the first, uh, I don't know what the volume is in the chemostat, but the first hour or something, only a small part will be labeled. Right, so most of the cells will still be eating the other, the original medium, or not? Yeah. I'm rewinding back to when we did this experiment to try to remember exactly how we did it. And I may have to come back to you. But, yeah, it, yeah. Perhaps we, grew, yeah, I, I'm going to have to come back to you and exactly how we designed the experiment, because the point you raise is totally valid. And, uh, because the dilution rate is, is, yeah. is typically how long it takes, not yeah. only before the cells grow, but also yeah. how quickly you. Yeah. That's true. That's true. Yeah. But not but the actual growth rate. Yeah. Right, but we did use this really simple formula where we say like, okay, we've got, we start with natural abundance, then we measured these cells, and we know the labeling strength, and we know the time, and so then we can go to division. 
So it, it may have been that we, we actually just dropped in water and, and closed the chemostat and grew them for half of a doubling time. Um, and I, I got to come back to you with that. Yeah, good question. And, and this uh, mu bar that you plot here, is it somewhat comparable to the dilution rate of the chemostat? Or? Yeah. That's a really interesting question. It is. But uh, let me go forward a little bit. So you've run the chemostat with different dilution rates. And so top, we're growing fast, and bottom, we're growing sl slower. And yeah, it's, com it's comparable, but there, there's an offset. And the offset changes um, as, you, as you change your, your chemostat and forest growth rate. Um, and there's, so there's something going on here with the isotopes, right? We're using the isotopes as a marker of how many divisions, how much material has been incorporated, and how many divisions that might be associated with. But there's also turnover. So there's, there's isotope uptake in excess of division that's going on as well. And so that, that turnover changes with the dilution rate here, which is related to your question. Um, yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm missing something here. Um, as I understand, you have a single snapshot, isn't yes. it? Yeah, we do. Uh, now that single snapshot has um, uh, cells and their daughters as well, right? Of course. So, so, uh, and you can identify who's the mother cell, who's the daughter cell uh, of a particular pair that you might be looking at, right? I, we can't identify that. You can't. Which is a big problem that we have, this planktonic so culture. So I, I don't understand how by a single snapshot in which you have a variation of uh, your isotope across the cell, you are able to deduce the growth rate. Uh, what's the calculation that you're doing? What are you estimating and what are you, how are you calculating the growth rate? Yeah, so we start, we start with some basal level of, in this case, deuterium, and then we measure this. And so basically we're saying, if, the, if we measure this, how, how, much, how much division would that be? So if it was 100% label strength, and we found, we found two cells, or it's just one cell, we found a cell, and it, it was 50% labeled. If we started out at zero, and we don't, because natural abundance, natural abundance is not zero, but let's pretend that we start out with zero D. And then we find a cell that has 50, and we do 100% label um, experiment, and we find a cell that's 50% labeled. And we say, okay, it started out zero, or 100% or protons, and now it's 50% protons and 50% deuterium, if it, if it divided one time. And so we get kind of shades in between that. We, we find 5% uh, deuterium. It's like, well, it hasn't divided, but it's, it's accumulating up the substrate at some, at, at this rate, because we know time in the experiment. Does that help? No. Um, I don't think about it. I'm, I'm not completely uh, sure about it, but uh, um, I, I'm concerned. I guess uh, you know there are different uh, there, there are different cells, uh, right? And in the time period that you have exposed them to um, uh, your uh, radio uh, isotope, stable isotope, st uh, right? Yeah. A, a stable. Uh, you know, okay, the, the the different is isotope. Yeah. Uh, you um, you know. Uh, different cells would be in different phases of their growth trajectory. Yeah. Uh, and um, they might start encountering it uh, at different times of their, uh, at different phases yes. uh, of their trajectory. Yes. Um, plus, uh, uh, yeah, so, I mean, the amount that they would have, I mean, the, you know, the variability of the amount that, uh, of, of the uh, stuff that you're measuring that they would have, could depend on a lot, lot of other things. Yeah. And how would you just zero in on, on uh, from that amount in that cell on the, growth, uh, on the growth rate of that cell? Yeah, that's an awesome question. And I don't think we can get to that from a planktonic study that we're doing. Um, we, can, we can pretend like it doesn't really exist and, and show the data like, th like this. Um, but th that's really sweeping this under the rug. That that as, you know, as a cell is dividing, 
<laughs> you know, the mother machine, we need to watch some videos um, after, after lunch or something and really watch this, right? But here we're sweeping that totally under the rug, and it's wrong. It should, yes, I agree. Yep, yep, yep. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree, so I'm feeling okay, but then every now and again I've seen a paper or I've talked to somebody who says that the, 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 the actual growth of the cell is not exponential. So is that, is that, okay, okay, so I'm, I'm happy you're not worried about this. I'm also worried about the, the x-axis. <laughs> Sorry, Matt. Just, just no. Um, great presentation. I just arrived uh, yeah. very, very late. Uh, as a microbiologist, I'm not a mathematician or informatician or whatever. Okay. But actually, this is a, that is a chemostate. So, actually, your gro growth curve will be always uh, in a log phase. Uh -huh. So, usually, all the bacteria inside should be always dividing, because yeah. in the normal microbiology, yeah. usual bacteria, if you use a chemostate, the bacteria, the bacteria inside should always grow in a log phase, so they are continuously, continuously yeah. dividing. So yep. it would be great. Uh, second question, do you have some insights also in the phosphorus incorporation uh, and not only on the hydrogen uh, incorporation? Yeah. For example, for the DNA, you know, yeah, sometimes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know if you have some insights or you plan to do it. Right, great, yeah, so we're in a chemostat, we think all the cells are dividing, we think that the ratio it should, yeah, we're just looking at ratios, so this, this, it does seem like we can kind of sweep this under the rug. Um, but, I, but I share Sanjoy's f feeling of looking down and feeling. <laughs> um, so where I'm, where, I'm gonna, where I'm trying to go now is to do this in a lineage resolved fashion where we can have the complete lineage history of the cells. We have all of the cells individual doubling times microscopically, and then we have the isotope label on top of that. That's gonna take you know, a year. To, to finish up, but we've got the methods sorted out now. Great question about phosphorus. Um, big bummer. Uh, state of the universe says that there's no stable isotope of P. So we can't do it. Yeah. Great question. Yeah, <laughs> yeah big bummer. Um, great. So cells grow slower, and the, the variability increases. Why? Let's um, rewind to Eric's talk yesterday. Really, really cool. Um, um, thinking about that, and we see that here as well. Why do we see this gigantic distribution, like yeah, yeah, some orders of magnitude higher, 100-fold difference, slow to fast? I don't know. And I don't know if it has something to do with Sanjay's question or not. Yeah, it's something I'm confused about. We've got multiple isotopes. So we can use deuterium as a proxy for biosynthetic activity. We've got a complex media, multiple nitrogen sources. We've added 15 and ammonium. Here's a plot where we can, we, we think we know the cell specific growth rate for every individual cell based off of deuterium incorporation. And so we know how much nitrogen should be incorporated into the cells to, to achieve this division. But on the left side of this plot, we see a bunch of cells that haven't incorporated any label from ammonium. So we think that these cells on the left that are growing really slow are taking nitrogen from amino acids in this complex media. As the cells grow faster and faster, it looks like they start to derive more of their biosynthetically required nitrogen from the label from ammonium. So it seems like there's some nutrient preference and it's growth rate dependent. But we're doing this chemostat experiment where we've got cells growing at long doubling times, growing slow, we've got this kind of medium rate in the middle, we've got this fast rate shown on the right. And apparently, this nutrient preference, it's not only growth rate dependent, but as you go from slow on the left, to kind of this medium growth rate in the middle, and fast on the right, it, it inverts. So why, why is that? Why, why do the cells like ammonium or amino acids, and they like it in different ways depending on the bulk dilution rate. That I don't, I don't know. This is a question that, I, that I'm confused about. But we can start to resolve nutrient preferences. 
I don't, I don't know why, why that is in this case. So the basic technique here um, allows us to, to get a picture um, of what we think is the, the growth rate diversity within the culture. Why is it so different from what we see from mother machines? I don't know. It's, it's worrying. It's interesting. Um, maybe we can do experiments. I've had some conversations with people in the room about uh, making really long mother machines where we can fix cell lineages in place and then, and then look at the isotope incorporation along a lineage. I'm doing that with agar pads right now, agar pad experiments. There's a lot of logistics to solve to get these, get the material into the nanosim, but at least with the agar pads, I think we're, we're just there to start doing experiments. But I'm really um, happy to brainstorm with others about how we might be able to um, actually have you know, microscopy on top of this and get away from planktonic growth, which I think confounds us. Question? So I think I've missed one point for your self-specific growth rate. Um, do you also use the light image or whatever for to kind of segment cells, and this is how you then determine which one is a cell to derive the growth rate from? Yeah, thanks for asking that. Yeah, so we have these ion images. Yes. And we actually just circle all of the cells. And then as a follow-up question, do you see any consequences of cell size, orientation, et cetera, on the yeah. growth rate that you're calculating? Super great question. In this case, none. Okay. It, we, see this, what we, we see this apparently huge variability in growth rate, and, there, and, and we've got pixels, so we know cell size, and there's no relationship between growth rate and cell size in this experiment. Okay. I don't know why. Great question. Sorry, I just thought of one thing. Is uh, stuff known like, um, I, I'm thinking there are some organisms like SAR11 that grow really slow, but if you look at them at single cell level, it's known that like 80% of them are dormant and only 20% of them are actually growing. Do you know if something like that also happens with uh, Staphylococcus and that's why you see this huge variation in growth rate? I don't know, is there a microbiologist in the room? There is. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't know. It's a great question. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, great. So I've already been up here for about an hour. You have 10 minutes. Oh, I have 10 minutes. <laughs> okay, it's almost lunchtime. We've already gone through some of these these things. These are, so so I've, I've tried to give you an overview of the instrument, its capabilities, some data that we've acquired, and, and we've already talked about things that I don't understand. Um, and so what do, we, what, do we, what do we want to incorporate next into these types of experiments? I'm trying to incorporate cell age and lineage history, like I mentioned with agar pads. Maybe it's fun to think about with, with mother machine. Um, I'm really curious about the di distribution of resources and biomolecules between mother and daughter cells. Is it 50-50? Is it and if it is, what is the distribution of new material compared to old material when, when cells divide? This is a question I think we could answer with this technique. Um, one thing that is completely ignored so far is variability in uh, the actual cell composition. Right? So, so I know when I've done transmission electron microscopy studies of cells, I can find some cells that have a ton of compartments and storage granules inside of them and other cells that, that don't. And this is gonna change all of our ratios and our whole notion of how, how ratios of isotopes can be correlated to growth rate. And so the, the variability in cell biomass um, is, is something that I think needs to be defined and investigated. And, and I think that's harder to do. How, how do we get a good picture of, of, the, of the C to N ratio in a cell? The, the nanosims kind of gives us that, but, but does anybody have an idea about how much variability in biomass composition there is with, between cells in a culture and how to, how to access that information? So we looked into this a little bit uh, we're using modeling, but um, because um, all these proteins that you're making are pretty large and um, they all well, take 20 amino acids, 
Uh, turns out that if you take, uh, if you just look at the proteome, you take uh, proteomic studies and you just calculate which amino acids are in there yeah. and the frequencies, they're really constant across, yeah. um, across conditions. Of course, it could change that you use more lipids or less, but uh, proteomic, I, I'm pretty sure it uh, remains the same. Yeah. Yeah, I feel good about the proteins too, but I worry about like glycogen or fatty acid storage and yeah, polyphosphate. Okay, um, what do people want to do? You want to ask some questions and talk? Or do you want to see some more, um, there's at least one question. I, the, I, I do have a few slides to show how we can apply this to these to, to multicellular consortia, and those might be interesting to talk about and show. Yeah, but a question. Yeah, yeah <clears throat> I was uh, also getting there. So my understanding about this system is that you need to fix these cells in order to, to image them and then understand the ratios, right? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, you were talking a bit about mother machines. So I'm wondering how you can do that there because there uh, you have cells in these microfluidic devices and they're extremely tiny. Yeah. How can you retrieve cells and then, um, and then look at them? Have you thought about that? Well, luckily I was uh, brainstorming the other day with um, Theo about this exact question. And luckily, we came into this room, and I started doodling on this <laughs> whiteboard out, <laughs> and it's still here. And it, it doesn't look very fancy, right? Um, just looks like some drainage system or something. So my idea that, that I had with Theo when we were talking was um, he's using PDMS. And so I, I said, OK, what, what if you make your kind of exit channel really, really long, and you've got glass on top and glass on bottom. You've got PDMS in between. And the daughter cells are all coming out, but you make that quite long, so you can kind of save save those cells. And here on the top are these wells where you're putting in nutrients. Um, you've got glass on top and glass on bottom. And so the idea that we had the other night um, was fix the cells in place chemically, embed them in plastic, so you've got the spatial structure um, there, and then peel the glass off, and then see if you can put that in this. Just one idea, but I, I don't know how to do it. Thanks. Oh, cool. Yeah. Yeah. That'd be great. Yeah, cool. Thanks for that. Yeah, well, I guess it all runs in the family because I did my postdoc in Victoria's lab, and that's <laughs> where I started noodling around with the nanosims. And yeah, so yeah, it's a good idea to, to chat with her and, and, and brainstorm. Um, okay, do people want to see a couple spatial, like spatial imaging? Okay, so this is so we're in the planktonic world, right? And we're and we're pretty confused because we don't know where the cells have come from, <laughs> right? Um, and this leads to this question: Okay, can we do it lineage? in a lineage resolved way. Let's rewind to my postdoc, and you mentioned Victoria. So Victoria's lab um, uh, looks at anaerobic methane oxidation, and that can happen in a, in a few different ways, but one way that, that it can happen is that you can have um, an archaea cell that can do C1 metabolism, take methane and go to CO2. Where do the electrons go? Good, good question. They go somehow, probably, over to these sulfate-reducing bacteria. So here's an image where we're using fluorescence in situ hybridization fish. We can paint cells based on their ribosomal sequences, their ribosomal RNA, using a probe that hybridizes to a specific sequence in the ribosome and has a little, fluores a little fluorophore on it. So in this case, the archaea, they're painted red, and these sulfate-reducing bacteria are in green. These are natural samples, really complex community. Here's a picture on the right. It's really just seafloor sediment, complicated mud. But the fish probes really allow us to go in and, and find um, cells of specific phylogenetic affiliation. Bad thing about fish probes is that the phylogenetic spe specificity is pretty broad. So I'm, I'm calling these sulfate-reducing bacteria and amniarchaea, but the, the fish probe resolution is, I don't know, genus or, or larger or something like that. It's not very good. It's kind of embarrassing. 
Um, and you, you might, you know, you might even notice funny things like the cells are a lot of different shapes and sizes, and even the fish probe seems to be interacting with the cell in different ways. And what's going on with that? I don't know. Is it different types of cells, or just still it's the same type of cell in different states? Not sure. But um, when I got into Victoria's lab, I, I'm not trained as a, as a microbiologist at all, so I was just playing around with the microscope and having fun. And um, I noticed these archaea um, bacteria consortia come in all sorts of shapes and sizes. And this got me really confused because if you think about the need to donate electrons to a centrific partner, and remember, one cell is taking electrons from methane and putatively trafficking those electrons to a partner. If that happens in any way, uh, in a process that's diffusion dependent, it seems like space should matter and size should matter. But you've got cell, you've got clumps of cells like, like this kind of big tanker up top where the archaea and the bacteria kind of hemispherically separated from one another, and then you've got things to the bottom left where they're all really really intermixed. And so people have had a had a blast doing all sorts of re reaction diffusion modeling and showing that like small, well mixed consortia that are centrophic should really outcompete these big um, hemispherically separated types up top, but you go into nature and you find those. And so I started wondering, like, okay, is there any relationship? What's going on with the with the size and space, spatial dependency here? There's an anosims in the basement of Caltech. Um, I could go and use it. So I decided to do a space uh, an isotope probe experiment. In this case, um, Yunbin had not yet filed the instrument down. Um, probably highly illegal compared to if you ask the Kamika um, company to do this. He had not filed it down, and so deuterium was not yet available on the instrument. So I just used ammonium to monitor uh, growth rate. Uh, what do we have here in this picture? We've got three-dimensional consortia. The nanosims is awful with, with, um, um, with depth. It goes out of focus, uh, I don't know, at, at like 20 nanometers or something. It's, it has no ability to track focus. You can do that manually, but if you've got anything that is not flat, it's awful to, 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 um, to try to get spatial resolution on. And so what I did is I put these consortia into plastic and I cut them. Now I've got one sheet, and that's what we're looking at here. It's a sheet, and I've concentrated these consortia, and that all of these little kind of stars in the sky here are these different consortia and uh, I've, I've painted them using this fish approach. Then we can put that in the nanosims. And we can get these phylogeny activity pairs from, from the instrument and from the microscope. And then we can start with all of these shapes and sizes, start asking really basic questions like, what's going on between archaea and bacteria that are right next to each other in comparison to archaea and bacteria that are very far away from us? What's going on with the size of the aggregate in terms of its biosynthetic activity? What's going on with the, the cell distance to the surface of the aggregate? And start asking all of these types of questions. And we did. It was really interesting. But it's time for lunch, so I don't know what to do. <laughs> I mean, should I keep going for five or 10 minutes? I don't know what to do. I, yeah. yeah. And we have to walk up the hill today, right? We're going to burn calories. We need to. Yeah. Do I have some questions? Yeah. Show the data. The data. The data. I, I, yeah, no. what a cliffhanger, right? It's really, really interesting. All right. Let's do it the other way around. There are no more questions, and you can show the data. That, uh, somebody has a question, they can ask uh, him after the talk. That's All right, it's my fault. I'm taking, taking responsibility. I'm going to go fast, and when, when people are like, we need to eat. <laughs> um, okay. So the first plot I want to show is a plot that shows the the kind of biosynthetic activity, the uptake of the 15N for sulfate reducing bacteria on the y-axis and for anemiarchaea on the x-axis. And in this plot, every data point is one consortium. And so what this data plot tells us is that the archaea biosynthetic activity is correlated to the bacteria activity. It doesn't have to be that case. It could, it could be that these things are just glommed onto one another and happen to be spatially um, next to each other, but they're growing at different rates, and they break off, and, and they do all sorts of stuff. 
But I thought this was kind of a, a, a really uh, kind of a test of this centrophic hypothesis. These cells are they're together, they're clumped on to one another, and they're growing in a proportional rate. Uh, blue and red, great, thanks for asking. Uh, blue and red are two um, different phylogenetic affiliations. So there's um, usually different fish probes that we can use, and there's a few, it's a big mixed community. Um, there's, two di there's a few different types of uh, sulfur-reducing bacteria in here paired with the same anemies, that we think is the same anemies, and we don't have the phylogenetic resolution to prove that, um, but different phylogenetic groups. Yeah. Okay. Um, so the, we think these things are, they're, we really think they're kind of co-breathing together, they're centrophic. But what about, what about our predictions from modeling? Uh, the picture on the left here by Bernard Schink, you know, we're predicting that well-mixed communities that are sharing electrons, something or, or a molecule that's subject to diffusion, is going to be much, much better off than a situation like the one on the right. But in the natural world, we find all of these shapes and sizes, which is confusing. And so we, we wanted to look a little bit at spatial positioning. And we derived a, a kind of a, a size-dependent way of capturing mixiness, if you will. Here on the top left, there's a checkered board. And on the top right, there's uh, you know, all the squares that have been separated. And so we did this in a way um, that's, that's kind of normalized to size. And I, I can't get, get into the equation right now. It's been Years, it's time for lunch. Um, but this is a, is, a, is a size normalized way of capturing the, the mixiness between two types of colors. And we tested that against the natural um, consortia. Here's on the left, there's this thing that's all mixed up. And then on the right, there's this one that we called Mickey Mouse. It's like these, you can see these pink, pinky ears up, up on the top. It's a little bit dim on the screen. But that one's really, really separated. So we've got this metric that captures the degree of um, spatial heterogeneity in here. So we asked, OK, if you look at the activity of these cells in the consortia, does it have anything to do with how segregated or how well mixed they are in the consortia? It doesn't have anything to do with that. We've got these two phylogenetic groups. It doesn't matter if the cells are like this kind of Mickey Mouse type, the archaea are totally you know, segregated from the, from the bacteria um, compared to very, very well mixed. A lot of growth rate heterogeneity and diversity in here. Um, but it doesn't have anything to do with the kind of bulk mixiness that we find in the consortia. Um, we, st we started trying to look inside of the consortia specifically and start to think about distance activity relationships. And um, that's kind of shown, illustrated nicely in this nice picture from Beth Orcutt, um, Christophe uh, Millet. Think about these cells packed in like this. You find consortia that look like this. You might think that the cells in the interior are at some sort of a disadvantage compared to the cells that are right at the interface of their centrophic partner. Here's an here's a example in nature that looks kind of similar to the, that previous picture. We started trying to analyze these distance relationships. And so we've got every single cell. We've got the phylogeny. We've got every single cell's ammonium uptake rate. We've got every single cell's position. And so we can put grids on all of these consortia and, and start to ask questions like, what's the, what's the activity you know, correlation of these two cells that are really close to one another compared to very far away from each other. We can do that across all of these consortia by using a z-score to normalize. And we see that the distance to the centrophic partner doesn't really have anything to do with the cell activity, either for archaea or for bacteria. It doesn't look like space is mattering here. Um, another thing we might ask is, is activity related to your proximity to the surface. You might think that access to nutrients is better on the surface of these consortia compared to buried in the middle. Look at that. You can be buried in the middle, 9 or 10 microns inside, and have the same activity as, as being on the surface. It doesn't look like act, the, there's anything to do with, with, uh, with spatial arrangement. Neither at the whole consortia relationship, how, how well you are mixed or how kind of clumpy you are, or whether or not you're, you're nestled up to your centrophic partner, or you're very far away from your centrophic partner. So we got these data, and we didn't know what to do for like a year. And we just, you know, we're just talking about it. What does this mean? What does it mean? And we start thinking, I don't know, there's this kind of new field. This is, this is a, while, a while back, kind of 
still because it's newer then, of uh, electromicrobiology and started thinking maybe the, maybe the cells are not sharing anything like a molecule, and maybe they're sharing electrons directly. And that might look something like this. Oopsies. Um, a cell might incorporate something like this beta, uh, this barrel protein into a membrane and then fill it up with heme groups and then stack a whole bunch of heme binding proteins on top and make a little nanowire or make a blanket, a conductive blanket on top of the cell surface and that might allow electrons to be trafficked around these, these uh, consortia. Remember percolation theory, can I get material from here to here or is there a path to go from here to here depending on the density of, of different types and the conduit you have, is the kind of problem that we have here. Look in the genomes of these anmiarchaea. You find these proteins that are some of the largest multi-heme cytochrome containing proteins that have been found in archaea, and they've got an, a surface layer domain. So it looks like they're embedded in the outside of the cell. The, these archaea have this kind of a liquid crystalline uh, cover on top of them. Maybe it helps hold, hold the cell together. That's called an S layer. These proteins, S layer domain, and then, and then it's studded, it's full of all, these mito, all of these heme, pro, uh, heme groups. This is all genomic prediction, by the way. Wanted to test that genomic prediction, looked into the really old literature um, where people were trying to measure the intracellular uh, compartment pH of um, different compartments in eukaryotic cells, and you could use peroxidases little, uh, you, you take a protein with a different pKa and it has a heme group on it. Depending on the pKa, that protein will be localized in different compartments according to the pH of that compartment. And then the transmission electron microscopy folks in the 70s, they used this peroxidase assay um, to, to paint, in this case, with, uh, with osmium, something that's a high Z element, something that has a lot of contrast with transition electro, transmission electron microscopy. We, did, we, we brought out <laughs> this this stain that hasn't been used for a long time, kind of brought it out of history and used it, I think, for the first time in archaea. Um, and we could paint in between the cells. You see images. If you look in these archaea between them, without the stain, you can see there's kind of something that looks like some sheath. It's just uh, some higher um, Z uh, number containing elements, a little bit less electrons going through. But we could paint the outside of these archaea and see this really black area. The blackness comes from a peroxidase activity where you add hydrogen peroxide as an oxidant and this molecule called diaminobenzidine is the reductant. It makes this big, um, not defined molecule that sticks to osmium. It's osmophilic and you can see it with the electron microscopy. Okay, and that allowed us all to, it allowed us to generate this model where we think that the archaea are syntrophically related to the bacteria based on interspecies electron transfer. And that's why we think there's no distance um, dependencies between these cells. It's time for lunch. <laughs> this is the whole thing that I've, 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 uh, I've mentioned. I, I went really fast in the last part of the talk, so if people want to talk more, um, let's have lunch and talk more. And I'm around for the rest of the week. And um, just want to show up another picture of the Institute. Um, we have beautiful cherry trees. Um, at the end of March, getting earlier and earlier every year. Um, this summer was the hottest um, in history in Japan. It was really hot. <laughs> um, so please, please come over. Um, we're, we're studying the origin evolution of life. Um, it's, a, it's a space that reminds me a lot of this space. I've had a really, really good time being here. Um, We've got labs in the basement, so if people are interested in doing lab experiments or, or theory, I think it's a really fun place to be. Um, and uh, we'd really welcome um, people to come over, and so, so feel free to keep in touch. Thanks for bearing with me during the long talk, and thanks for all the questions. So one more question, only one. <laughs> all right. You have one more. Later. Oh, what do you mean later? <laughs> oh, good question. Great, great. Potentially the most important so question that's asked the most during important the meeting. Question <laughs> involved, right? One more question? Uh, no, scientific no, so you can have lunch, I think, and you have some comment? No. On lunch. Oh, yes.
let's thank Sean again. And um, so there are uh, 